Welcome to this presentation, um, deriving actionable insights from high volume media streams. Uh, I'll first pre present us, and I <coughs> on stage I also brought my colleague uh, Jörn Kottmann, who is a senior software engineer at uh, Sandstone in Luxembourg, doing uh, intelligence stuff, right? And um, he's a member of the Apache Software Foundation and a PMC chair and committer on Apache Open NLP and a PMC committer on Apache UEMA. <coughs> and myself, I'm uh, Peter Tusen. I'm a senior software engineer at, uh, and partner at um, a small startup in Denmark called Pagel, and we do uh, intelligent uh, search queries and um, media, media monitoring and uh, media analysis. And I'm also a PMC and committer on uh, Open NLP. Right. So today's topic is also uh, I will go through um, a small introduction on natural and um, take you from there to um, natural language processing, and then uh, Jan will take over. <coughs> so what is uh, natural language processing? Well, uh, I guess I'm speaking it right now. No, sorry, not processing, just natural language. So what is uh, which? Natural language is any language that has evolved naturally in humans through use and repetition without conscious planning or premeditation. That's the definition we can find on Wikipedia. And uh, basically it means from the day we came down from the trees or out of the caves and were grunting to where we are today and we can communicate in a much richer language. <coughs> so what is not a natural language? Well, uh, database tables, uh, source code, um, math equations uh, is not a natural language even though we humans have created it. And <coughs> the reason is, there's a, may, maybe they share a, a few uh, characteristics, but natural language has some other ca characteristics, like it is unstructured and it can be ambiguous, which um, let's say software code tend not to be. And uh, <coughs> also in uh, natural language we can we, we have the, the opportunity to save things in many ways, so it's rich and we can use irony and we have metaphors. It can also be an, uh, noisy and we can hide semantics in it and it uh, can be quite unpredictable. So <coughs> uh, natural language can actually be rather complex and hard. So uh, yeah, uh, our encyclopedia is a um, collection of human knowledge and a lot of natural language. Maybe this is the upcoming part of the natural language. <laughs> and um, as we get more and more data, we get flooded every day, it comes more and more petabytes of documents we need to uh, look at every day, or we, at least we get them every day. And that means that we need a smarter way to process all this data in a, in, in, in a quicker way. So this is where natural language processing comes to the rescue. So what is natural language processing? Again, we have a definition here from Wikipedia. It appears the field of computer science, artificial intelligence, computational linguistics, blah, blah, blah. That has something to do with uh, the interaction between humans and computers. So it's like, how do we extract uh, the value out of text? That is what NLP is all about. So, let's be, if we take this small example, it's like, how do we get from the unstructured left part to the right part, which, is, which has some kind of structure? Let's say the Wikipedia and the news outlets at the bottom. So that this is what we are trying to, um, to use uh, LP for, to uh, accomplish uh, a better structure. And how? Well, we'll... Um, We'll divide the task into smaller steps and uh, process them like in a sequence of some kind. And the first step we usually always do is to do uh, language detection. And uh, that's because many languages has their own um, definitions of what is sentences, what is tokens, and we'll come into those in a second. So let's say first step is natural, uh, is detecting the language. <coughs> and then we'll 
quite often do a sentence detection. And let's say in this sentence, we have Mr. Robert is today at room number seven. Let's go. Yeah, the, by intu intuition, a lot of people will just say, oh, well, a sentence that always ends with a dot. So every time we see a, a period, then that's the sentence. But it's not that simple, and it varies from language to language. In this case, Mr. period or MR period is definitely not the end of a sentence. And we also have the abbreviation for a number. So <coughs> um, another part we do after we have created, like we have found all the sentences, is to tokenize. And the tokenizer is just to break it up into even smaller parts. You can say the words of the of the text, and you, and again here there are uh, also uh, language specific rules for that. So, um, Mr. will be one token, and um, notice that between seven and the la and period it is two tokens, right? So seven is one token, and period is a second token. <coughs> After the sentence detection and the tokenization, we normally do um, entity recognition, uh, like finding the names. Uh, in this case here, we, we show how we found the person, Washington, who was the first president of the US. And um, we also found the place or the location called um, Washington, which is all in the uh, Northwest region of the United States. You could also have models that can find um, organizations. And this also is an example of how we can um, uh, even fi find a word that actually means two different things. Right. Another step we usually do is um, part speech tagging. And those familiar with uh, linguistics uh, will probably know a little more about it. So <coughs> it is like taking each word or each token and trying to determine which uh, word class does this word belong to? So, Laura Keen, uh, a proper noun, and then P is from the pen, uh, pen tagger um, corpus. And uh, <coughs> then we have like brushed is a verb, uh, by is a preposition, him is a pronoun, and glass and water are nouns, which can be useful uh, to know uh, what kind of word. It does. <coughs> Depending on your task, uh, sometimes it also makes sense to do limitization, either to reduce your vocabulary or maybe you want to index it and you don't want all the variants of a word. So, <coughs> uh, he's better than many others would be he be good than many other because be is the base of the verb else to be. And good is the base of better. And others we, is just stamped, and we end up with other. So all these steps, uh, if I try to show them on a graph like this, a chart, we'll end up with something to this. We'll do some language detection. We do some sentence detection, tokenization, post tagging. We also have something called a chunker that I didn't mention, but a chunker is uh, the piece that can find uh, that can find all the phrases, uh, noun phrases, verb phrases. We do lamentation and name finder, and as this drawing also illustrates, some of these can actually be done in parallel. So, um, yeah, Are yeah, you ready? Okay. So yeah, welcome everyone to the conference. I hope you had a nice time so far. So um, yeah, for work I do a lot of uh, NLP, and uh, one of the tools I keep coming back to is uh, OpenNLP. I'm also involved with a uh, project. Um, OpenNLP was uh, founded in 2004 by uh, Jason Broadridge and others, and um, Jason's now with uh, Google's NLP group, and um, another very uh, influential person is uh, Thomas Morton. He wrote most of the early uh, code base um, for his uh, PhD thesis. Um, today the project is at, at Apache, it's uh, actively uh, developed. Um, for most of the tasks we use machine learning to solve them, since we are dealing with unstructured data, that's um, uh, the best approach we have these days. It's written in, in Java, it uh, has uh, zero dependencies, it's um, easy to integrate into your uh, own software projects. So usually when you do NLP, you would have um, some data you want to process, and this means you have to uh, train on your own data to um, 
to get the uh, best possible results. And um, sometimes you even need to customize the NLP engine uh, itself. And this is both easy with open NLP because it's just the use case we, um, we support. Um, so in open NLP, we have many small components or services and um, it's a project philosophy and not to um, provide anything to put them together. There's no pipeline, no plumping layers, nothing in this direction. And we just leave this to frameworks which uh, can do that, like Apache Spark or Apache um, Flink. So the system is uh, reasonable fast, so it's probably not a performance bottleneck. Uh, one of the things we just added last month is the language detector. We are very um, uh, proud of this. Um, on the JVM, there's only um, Julio's uh, lung detect, um, but the open NLP one can detect 103 languages. And um, yeah, we're also distributing um, this model under the Apache license so you can use this in your software. We also do all the other tasks, like <coughs> sentence detection, tokenization, part of speech tagging, named entity recognition, lemmatization. We just spoke about this, also chunking and, and parsing. So let's speak about language detection. Um, one thing we need to do is we need to generate uh, features and then these features are classified into some category. In this case, um, we're using um, ISO 6393 uh, codes. And um, the features we use are character engrams. So we see here this, um, this example. And um, it's important to understand that the character engrams, they contain spaces and, and things like that, and or um, punctuation. And um, to just go to one example, so the first um, tree gram here would be um, space, th, the second one would be uh, thi, then it's uh, his, and the last um, tree gram would be um, is, uh, space. And this then works accordingly to, um, um, for longer or shorter um, um, character engrams. Um, we trained this on the Leipzig uh, corpus, it's a high quality data, um, and um, you can download the data, train your own model, sometimes maybe you have a specific use case, and you can just get the data and uh, train by yourself if you like to. So uh, at OpenNLP, like I said, we train on the Leipzig corpus. We uh, host the data. There's a subversion repository where you can go check it out with uh, SVNCO. See a command here, first one online. The data is, is uh, rather big. It's uh, 25 gigabytes of, of data. And um, it's actually so much, it, it's too much to train OpenNLP on this amount of data. And also for uh, language detection, it's not necessary to, um, to have so much data. So what we do is we text the data and uh, uh, extract like two um, subsets, one for training and one for evaluation. So in this case, we um, go there and say we take uh, five sentences. That's a, a second command here. And um, we want to extract, um, so we take five sentences per, um, per sample and we want to extract uh, 2,000 samples per language, which then uh, gives us 10,000 sentences for each language. So this um, will um, be written to the LDA train TXT, and then we do the same for the evaluation data, but now it's important um, this doesn't overlap. So here we tell it uh, to um, skip 2,000 examples and then only uh, takes a different um, set of samples. So next step is um, to train the language detector. That's the uh, language detector train command. So we tell it where to write the model, about the parameters, um, we had find the data, and that's it. This will run for quite some time, it's also memory intensive, but eventually you will get the uh, language uh, detection model. And now the last step is um, to see how well does my model uh, perform. And we have built in evaluation in OpenLP for every component. And um, so the um, evaluator needs to get the uh, trained model. We give it the um, evaluation data, and now it um, can print out all the um, uh, samples which were not classified correctly. Let's say misqualified a true parameter. But with the reports output file, it can also write like a much more uh, detailed uh, results like um, a confusion matrix, the accuracies uh, on a per language basis, overall accuracy. So with this data, the overall accuracy is around 99%. And there are some uh, language pairs which perform rather badly because they are very similar. So let's go on. For this presentation, we use onto notes uh, to train English models. So we have, again, these uh, training commands. So here we train the token name finder. Um, 
and the uh, dot under notes um, tells it which uh, format support um, to use. We have built in format support for a long list of um, Copora, and um, so we have to tell it the language. It finds the data and visualizes the model. It's very similar for the um, part of speech tagger. We again tell it to try on the auto notes uh, format, and um, then in the end we have to write the maximum entropy model. So English is the uh, first language we use in this uh, presentation. And the second one is uh, Portuguese, so the code is uh, P-O-R for, for it. Um, and here um, we again train the different components, tokenizer, part of speech tagger, chunker, then the token name finder. So it's approximately the same. The format we have here is uh, AD. It's the um, Amazonia uh, corpus. And um, yeah, so we train on this. We will later see some, um, some example on how this uh, looks. So let's um, look a bit how to use the APIs. Um, here we picked the name finder API. Um, so first, you need to lo load the model. That's the first line here, talk name finder model. And then we uh, tell it where it is. It's using the URL to, to load the model. The model itself can be uh, shared across threads. And then you would uh, create a per set, a per, per, per thread, a name finder instance. That's the second line here, name finder me. Um, we create that. And, um, now we want to use it to process multiple documents. Uh, that's the outer for loop. We iterate over the, um, over the documents, and then um, a document consists of multiple sentences, and we would again iterate over the sentences, and um, each sentence we pass to the name finder, and then we get back the, um, the spans um, which mark the um, names inside the uh, input uh, sentence array. So it could, for example, be named from index uh, three to, to six. Um, and when we are done with the document, we have to once call the clear adaptive data, and um, then we can process the next document. So the next step is, how do we train when we want to use the API? Um, first, we create an, uh, a stream of the uh, input um, sample objects. It's basically a, a sentence annotated with the uh, names. So we set this up, and um, then we go here to the name finder uh, me uh, train method. We have to tell the language, which uh, type we want to train on. We pass on the stream, and um, a couple of other things, like the um, parameters for the machine learning, and the, um, the way this uh, token name finder factory should be set up. So this will then take a bit, and at the end, it writes out the uh, trained model to uh, to a disk or to an output stream, wherever you want to, to write it. So now that we have trained the model, we want to evaluate the model. And for evaluation, we need the model. We set up the, uh, the um, name finder ME instance. We uh, now um, load the evaluation data via a sample stream again. We pass this to the evaluate method. Then this would run over the data. It uh, can count out the mistakes the name finder does. And, um, then it would give us a so-called F measure, which contains a precision and recall score. And we print it out, and yeah, so that's it. But um, this has a problem that uh, you actually need to split your data into training and evaluation data. And you don't always want to do this. And for that, we have the uh, cross-evaluation. And um, there, we would um, split the data into n parts. And we would always leave one part out and train on all the other parts. And this we do n times. So we once uh, trained or tested on uh, each part. Uh, at the end, we um, just um, build the mean of all the um, numbers we get, or the F measures we get, and uh, then can print this out. So the, um, the thing is here, when we create the token name finder cross validator, we have to pass in all the parameters we also would need for the training, and then we need to give it uh, the data. Yeah. So. So like I said before, we just provide the components, and uh, you have to put everything yourself together. And um, in the NLP field, for a long time, this was always done, this uh, Apache UEMA. But just in the last years, we, we've got a couple of uh, other solutions which can uh, also um, do this very, very well, like Apache Spark, Apache uh, Kafka Streams, there's um, NiFi, or there's Apache Flink. And um, yeah, I really like uh, streaming. so. That's why I decided here for this uh, 
to just talk to, to use um, Apache Flink. Apache Flink is a very mature project. It uh, has support for Java and, and Scala. And um, the nice thing is we can use it to plump things together with small pipelines. We will see this in the next slides. And then um, Flink will make sure that this uh, runs and it can also uh, scale out if necessary to hundreds of, of machines. So let's take a look at the uh, first pipeline. So you just uh, recall this uh, um, a diagram we saw before from, from Peter's talk, uh, from Peter's part, and he um, said we first do uh, language detection. So how do we get started with uh, Flink? We first have to create the uh, streaming execution um, environment. Uh, we do that. We have to read the data. In this case, we read uh, um, from a huge uh, Afro um, a data dump from disk. We read the data, and uh, now we actually here at the uh, last uh, block, um, start to um, process the data. So the first thing we do is we apply the language detector function, and um, then we know which language is the stream in. And the next step now is to split the stream into the languages, and then we have uh, uh, different pipelines for each uh, language. So the first pipeline we have is uh, for English. So it's, uh, we do just step-by-step -step sentence detection, tokenization, part of speech tagging, chunking, and then um, the uh, chunker depends on the post tagger, so it is important that this is uh, behind. And uh, all three um, need to get uh, input, which was first cut into sentences and into tokens. And the last step is name finder, but the name finder could also be uh, just after the uh, tokenizer. So when we are done processing this data, we write it all into Elasticsearch, and um, this then allows us to uh, visualize data or uh, query it. So that was our English uh, pipeline. And for uh, Portuguese, it's just the same, um, but at this time we uh, uh, use the Portuguese models. So just the, um, the models are different, and that's the entire difference we have here for the uh, two languages. So. And in the first part for the split, we need a, a language selector, which is a uh, Flink output selector, and um, it just uh, keys uh, the um, uh, document to the language. So now we uh, do the uh, part of speech tagging and named entity recognition, but this one is just a part of speech here. Yeah. So in, um, in Flink, we have the uh, rich uh, map function, and that's important for us because, like I said in the beginning, we need to uh, um, have one post tagger instance or one name finder instance per thread, and we can manage this here in the open function. So in the open function, we would first create the post tagger ME from the, uh, from the model file, and then later on, we can use this in the map function to um, analyze our sentence. So we get a sentence as input, which is uh, tokenized, so it's a string array, and then it would uh, compute the tag for each uh, word in that uh, sentence like we saw uh, also earlier in the um, graphic. So it's basically the same for the, uh, for the uh, uh, name finder. We can have a rich map function, create the name finder in the uh, open. The model is shared between threads. The name finder is created per, uh, per thread. And um, the input is, again, a uh, tokenized uh, sentence. We pass this to the name finder. It detects the name spans. There can be multiple names inside one sentence. And then, in this case, we just uh, write into a name sample, which is a sentence with the uh, names, and uh, outputs this here. So yeah, what's coming next? Um, OpenLP is mostly uh, using uh, maximum entropy and uh, perceptron, but these days everything is going to um, deep learning, and uh, our goal is to um, find a deep learning uh, library we can use to um, also implement all these components uh, with uh, deep learning. So these days, LSTMs are very uh, popular for natural language processing. So they usually perform the best um, on all uh, given tasks we have, more or less. And um, yeah, we just need to implement this. Another thing we would like to do is we want to ship more um, pre-built um, models. We probably will start training on um, universal dependency tree bank. And then we'll be able to ship uh, pre-trained models for maybe like 10 languages or so. I'm not sure how many it will be uh, exactly. Um, yeah, another goal we have is to make the language detector perform better on short texts. Uh, today you would need uh, two sentences and they would need to be written in the same language. 
we get an okay performance, and um, yeah, we would like to make this perform better on really short inputs, like uh, only a couple of words. Yeah, so here's the uh, OpenNLP team. So it's uh, Sunil Marty, Tommaso, um, Astu, William, Daniel, Rodrigo, Koji, Bruno, and um, Jeff. And yeah, so we um, prepared a small demo with the uh, Gibana dashboard, and I will uh, give back um, to Peter, and he will show us a little bit. Um. Yeah, thank you, Jan. Yeah, we have like a uh, small four minutes left. See if this will work. No. No. Help. <laughs> I think I need a technician down there. Is there a tech guy who can join me down here for a second? Yeah, I guess it always goes like this. I want this one up there. I have five. Okay, then I just have to move it to another window. <coughs> yeah, what do we have here? And it's impossible to see what's going on on the on the right part. <coughs> what we did here is that um, the cloud will all the names are obviously person names, so we use the um, the persons we found with the uh, named entity recognition for English, as a limited the search, which you cannot see either on the top here. I'm saying I want English, language English. And then I said for fun, uh, let's say that we want something with Russia and Trump. And then it will highlight, the, of course, the persons that are related with stories about Donald Trump and Russia. And for those who are familiar with the case where he might or might not have spoken with the Russians during his campaign. You'll notice that even though they are Americans, most of these persons, um, like uh, uh, <coughs> you have um, George Papadranpoulos was uh, his um, foreign advisor who um, resigned and we have like Paul Manafort and um, Rick Gates, who were part of the campaign, probably those who were under investigation by Robert Mueller, the FBI guy. <coughs> and uh, to the right, if I wish it would have been a little more clear what he's saying here, but here we use the chunker to find the um, uh, significant terms. Phrases, sorry, not terms. Yep. And uh, we get something like, um, even I can't read it from here, um, something has to do, of course, with the, the campaign and the FBI, and that is also relation to uh, Hillary Clinton and stuff like that. So um, I think the time is 
almost we're almost out of time. So if someone have a question, I think now would be the right time to just fire off a few questions. Otherwise, if you have any questions about open NLP, just come down and uh, we'll be happy to talk with you. We or we can go out. Yep. No? No questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>